Good afternoon. I would like to invite you on my first uh, session today, and this first part of my HTML5 sessions here. I will speak today about markup. My name is Štěpán Bechinský. I'm developer evangelist from Microsoft uh, Czech Republic. This, I call this uh, some kind of the motivation slide. Probably the most important application now in your computer is of a browser. The standard user use the web browser approximately 57 up to 60 percent during the time he is using the computer. And you know, there are a lot of people that are not using you know some email clients on the computer because they have email clients inside the web browser. They doesn't use some kind of applications because those applications are in the browser now. So web browser becomes a very, very important application, not just in your computer, but in your mobile phone or your tablet too. Now you can see the official logo and official slogan of uh, W3C Consortium. W3 World Wide Web Consortium is the standardization organization which is responsible for web standards. W3C is responsible for HTML, markup. W3C is responsible for CSS, for some JavaScript APIs, for web services, and so on. Uh, in the history, World Wide Web Consortium were more you know, some kind of traditional and conservative institution. But now they become more closer to industry and you will see it uh, today. So what is it HTML5? HTML5 is probably the future of the web development, or it's definitely the future of the web development, but it's probably a future of development for some kind of devices. So for example, you can write HTML5 application for tablets, you can write HTML5 application for your mobile phones, and in the future, it will be possible to write HTML5 application for the standard computers. Of course, it's, uh, it doesn't have sense to use HTML5 for everything. Probably, you can imagine that it's not possible to write a printed driver for in using the HTML5. But this is actually much faster, and in the future, it will be the, it will be the same. HTML5 is only one thing, which is real multi-platform. It's only one you can use on different devices and different operating systems. If you take any compute, if you take any smartphone, there is a web browser supporting HTML5. If you take any tablet, there is a web browser supporting HTML5. Especially, it's very important for on iOS because you know that the Apple is really against the Flash. And for example, if you want to play some video inside the browser, HTML5 is the only way, which is really multi-platform. Uh, there are, you know, two opinions what HTML5 is. The one opinion is it's a just markup language. Another opinion, it's my opinion too, that HTML5 is a, some kind of the framework which allows you to write your application from the beginning to the end. Unfortunately, HTML5 is not a final specification. I will speak about it later, but you must be very careful which parts of HTML5 you will use, because you can get in the big troubles if you use some unstable part. I will speak about it today uh, later. What is good for us, the HTML5 markup is in the last goal status during the standardization process in W3C, and probably it will be finished next year. So next year we will probably have the final specification of HTML5 as a markup. But we will see if it can change in the future, of course. Uh, small history about HTML5. <coughs> as I told you, in the past, the HTML, uh, the, sorry, W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, was some kind of traditional academic and a very conservative institution. And those guys from W3C had absolutely no idea what is doing outside, what is happening outside. So they decided in 1998 that HTML is bad. The last version of HTML must be 4.01. 
and the only future is XHTML 2.0. And they start, they stopped to work on HTML, they started to work on XHTML 2.0. But, you know, there is a little problem, and the name of the problem is backward compatibility. So what happened if you have a broken HTML code, the code, HTML code is non-valid, and you send it to some browser, what happened? Almost nothing. You can see the result. Because HTML is not XML, and the browser can handle the problems inside the wrong HTML code. But imagine what happened if the, it must be well-formed XML, because XHTML is a XML, so what happens if, if you have some error in the code? Exception. The parser stopped. The parser stopped working. And because of this problem and some more problems around the XHTML specification and about the process, the guys from industry, the guys from Apple, Google, Opera, established a new working group for HTML. The name of this group is Hypertext Application Technology Working Group. And they're starting to producing new specifications for old HTML. And those specifications were very close to the industry needs. So they started with Web uh, Forms 2.0. It's a new version of Web Forms. You probably know those input boxes and buttons and so on. They started with Web Application 1.0, Web Applications. It's a set of APIs, for example, there are APIs which allows you to access uh, files on the client computer directly from the JavaScript. You will see this uh, tomorrow in my third session about HTML5. In 2006, the guys from W3C wrote some memo and they started, we were over-optimistic and they, let's say, apologized for the work on XHTML. And in 2009, they stopped working on XHTML. They took the work from Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, put it together with old HTML, and this is what we know as HTML5. So, who is working on HTML5? Now we have four groups working on HTML5. It's W3C, it's ECMA. Do you know ECMA? Okay. Who does not like that? Yes. Three, four. Okay. So, the rest of you, you don't use JavaScript, okay? The correct name of the JavaScript is ECMAScript. The JavaScript is a trademark of some microsystems. So, the correct name of the JavaScript is ECMAScript. So, ECMA is working on JavaScript. The last version of JavaScript is version 5. Again, I will speak about it in my last session. What VG, what WG, Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, the situation now is that this group is working on something and they send it to W3C. Again, if W3C did something, does something, it is sent it to what VG. And we have one more group, and the name of the group is Kronos. Kronos is responsible for WebGL. WebGL is a 3D system for the canvas. I will speak about it in my next session uh, later after. So, we have four groups working almost on the same, or on the technologies which are, which works together. And the situation is, uh, let's say, not so good because there are some differences between the specification, and it really depends on the browser vendor, how the browser vendor handle this situation. Let's say there are two extremes. The one, one extreme is the Microsoft and Internet Explorer. We are supporting only stable parts of specification from W3C and ECMA. We doesn't, we doesn't support anything from what VG and or, or Kronos, because the W3C is the main one. And we're supporting just what is stable in the time of new version of Internet Explorer. Because the Internet Explorer must work the same way for the next 10 years. Five years full support, plus five years security support. Another extreme is Google Chrome, because in Google Chrome you can find almost everything, which is, let's say, week old, but after one or two versions, it disappears because the specification is so unstable that it's 
no one is using it, or the specification disappear from the uh, standardization process. Firefox and Opera is somewhere between. Okay, the small statistics about W3C HTML working group. As you can see in the head of the group, there are people from the industry. There is a guy from IBM, guy from Microsoft, guy from Apple. It's very important for us as web developers because there are people from the industry and they are pushing HTML to industry needs, not just some academic needs, just really to industry needs. All specifications from W3C are for free, so you can freely use it, you, are, you can freely implement it. Uh, status of HTML5. Now I will speak about HTML5 as uh, some big framework. So you know that for the HTML5 is responsible W3C and ECMA. W3C is responsible for HTML, for CSS, web apps, it's a, it's a set of JavaScript APIs, my last session tomorrow, SVG, it's a scalable vector graphic, and we have the ECMA. And there are much more technology inside these bigger groups. I think it's very important for you to know how process in W3C works. So if you, if you are some company, you are a part of W3C and you want to prepare a new recommendation, a new standard. So you started with the first working draft. The first working draft is some kind of document, the first, really the first version of the specification. If more companies decided, okay, the specification is good, we need it, so we want to create a real recommendation, okay, it will be worth, it, it, be, it goes to the status of the working draft. Working draft means that everyone is working on the specification, it's a some document, the people from the W3C are working on it, all experts and so on. After some time, people decided, okay, it's finished, we don't want to change anything, it's almost perfect. And it goes to the status of the last call. Last call means that this is the last chance to do big changes or to change something in the specification. If some, uh, if some specification survived last call, it became the candidate recommendation. If not, it goes back to working draft. Candidate recommendation means the specification is done, it's finished but we don't have enough independent implementation of that specification. The recommendation is a total final, it's a, and it's a totally ready for everything. It means we have enough independent implementation of some specification. And now, we will work with things which are in working draft now, Something is in last call, almost nothing is as a recommendation. So everything what's new in HTML5, it's really not finished. So what we can do with that? Because the vendor browsers, uh, because the vendor browser, uh, sorry, because the web browsers vendors want to implement some parts of uh, HTML5 and they know it's not finished. So all vendor browsers, started to use vendor prefixes. Vendor prefix is, let's say, some kind of warning for you web developers, of, and it means we want to use this functionality, for example, some CSS rule or some method in JavaScript, but we know that this functionality is not finished, we know that it cannot change in the future, but we think it will, in the future, it will, it will work like our implementation. So be aware about vendor prefixes because it's really some kind of warning. It can change in the future. Uh, the vendor prefixes you will especially see in my second and the third part. Okay, now I will speak just about HTML5 markup. The guys from the what VG group and they started to work on HTML5 or on improving the old HTML4, they 
no right for deciding to make some, they have some, you know, philosophical idea about HTML5. The first, HTML as a, HTML as a markup must describe only the structure of the document. Because it was the first idea of HTML5, do you know how HTML5 is old? Maybe it's older than some people here in the room. It's 20 years old. So before 20 years, the HTML5 was used just to describe the structure of the document for nothing more. Maybe you remember the element font. It's not about the content, it's about how it should like. And it's, it's wrong. The second one, it must be closer to industry needs. You will see today, for the second session or tomorrow, in my third session, you will see that there, is, uh, there, are, there are a lot of things in HTML5 and markup or in CSS which, were, which are totally new, but, is, well, but uh, those things are commonly used. In the past, we used JavaScript to do some stuff, in C, to do some stuff, but now it's, a, it's the, the things we use, the things or the functionality for which we needed uh, JavaScript is now part of a markup language or CSS. It cannot break the web, so the old browsers must be able to work with the new markup. And what is very important for us, the big part of the HTML5 markup language specification contains rules for HTML parsers. So every parser should handle HTML document in the same way. Here you can see a very small sample. You can see on the left side I have non-valid HTML. You can see there is some missing I element. And on the right side you can see two results of two different parsers. Two document object model because the result of the parser is document object model. So if you have document, HTML source code, it goes through HTML parser, and on the end, you have document object model. This kind of the tree. But if you have from one source code two different object models, it's a huge issue. Because JavaScript doesn't use the source code of HTML. It uses document object model. CSS uses document object model. So if you have from the one source code two different obje object models, it's a big problem. The first one is the correct one. This is, this is from Internet Explorer 10, because Internet Explorer 10 is supporting the new parsing rules from HTML5 specific package. The bottom one on the right side is some older one from the older version of Internet Explorer before there were rules how to parse HTML code when the HTML code is wrong. I think this is the most important part of HTML5 specification. Okay, basics of HTML5. This is the valid and absolutely minimalistic HTML5 document. And look at the doc type. The doc type is just HTML. No version, nothing more, just HTML. Probably you are missing here something. Body element, HTML element, head element. But the modern parsers doesn't need it because in the specification it's very clear that meta and title should be in the head. Element paragraph should be in body and around that should be HTML. So let's see. Switch to demo. I have here uh, validated the uh, services from the W3C. I take my strange HTML5, I open it in web browser. We can see it, it's no problem. And if we put it to parser, okay, so it's fine, it's valid. The warnings are that, the, that uh, this validation service is experimental and the second warning is about w, uh, UTF-8. But it's valid. And if we look to on document object model, HTML is there, 
hat is there, but it's there. So it works, it's correct. Now I'm using uh, developer tools from Internet Explorer 9. Of course, what I want to show you is what, what the new modern parsers can do. Of course, don't use it this way. We have HTML, we have body, we have head. So please keep your coding standards you have now. I just wanted to show you what is possible with the new parsers. Nothing more. One more thing, the HTML5 is not XML. It's not based on uh, SGML languages. So everything what is here is valid. I especially recommend you the last style of writing uh, meta tags and, and attributes and so on. Only thing, you must use the apostrophes around the value of the attribute when there is a space inside the uh, value of the attribute. Okay, back to roots. As I told you, the main philosophy of HTML5 is that it must be close to industry needs and should describe the structure of the document. And you need some semantic elements, or you have some semantics elements in all versions of HTML5. You have H1, it's a made heading. You have image, it's an image. You have table, it means that there is a table. You have, uh, let's say, strong, it means it's important, and so on. But now, the needs are totally different, and we really need to describe the content of the document as good as possible. And the reason is very simple. Search engines and monetization of our web, because everyone need, want to be on the top in the search engine results. So we need to add as more semantics to the document as possible. But the biggest problem now is the element diff. In element diff, you use element diff to position the parts of the web page on the screen. So on this small picture, you can see the typical web page, the structure of the typical web page. I have something on the top, I have something on the bottom, I have something on the side, and I have my main content. But I am using just element diff, and the element diff has no semantic meanings. So, the guys Opera did small, small statistics. I show you the, the result of statistic on the next slide. And uh, they found that all web developers are using semantics inside the web page, but they put it, you know, to the strange, to the strange uh, place inside the web page. Do you know where's the semantics? In the value of ID attribute or in the value of the class attribute. It's typical if you want to, if you have some header, so use ID and the name of the ID is header. The same for the footer and so on. So we have semantics in um, our web pages but on wrong place. I think you know Wikipedia. Ah, probably yes. If you look to the source code, hey, ID content sounds good. ID footer. What about Facebook? Do you know Facebook? No, of course not. So the document Jack model for of Facebook is quite big, so it takes some time. And again, global container, sounds good. It should be probably the main part. Voila, I have footer here. Strange. So we have semantics on web pages now, but on the totally wrong place. Here you can see the statistics of the most used values of ID attribute. The winner is footer, the second place is content, and the third place is a header. So we have semantics there, totally wrong place. Okay, small quiz. Uh, do you know why the layer one is on the ninth place? It's an export from Photoshop. And table one is probably for the most used HTML editor word. Okay. So, based on those statistics, in HTML5 we have new semantics elements. 
So the typical HTML5 page looks like the picture on the right side. Instead of div ID header, I have element header. I have element nav for navigation. I have element article for the common content. I have element footer for the footer. So the header, footer, article, and so on, there are box elements similar to div, but in the name of the element, there is a semantic meanings. Here you can see the list of semantic elements. This is some you know, base list of semantic elements. For example, the combination of figure and fig caption is very, very strong because the figure and fig caption together, so you can, you can put or you can connect some description or some title, let's say, for example, to some object, for example, for picture. So you have the figure, inside you have picture, and the fig caption means, okay, this title belongs to that picture. Again, very important for search engines. And of course, those semantics elements are very important for people who have some problem, who have some disabilities with the eyes, so the blind people, because for the screen readers, it's much easier to jump directly to the first article on the page because it's a main content than to looking around what's that, is, what is inside the page. Because we have uh, quite a lot of new semantic elements, every element in the W3C specification has description like this. This is the part of W3C specification for element article. You can f so you can find there when to use it, when to don't when you don't use it, what is it, why to use it, and you know again some description what is this element good for. But again it's uh, it's not enough. And on my last, in one, on, on my one session in Prague, I got a question, okay, I like those semantics elements, but you know, I, am, I have a web about the docs, it's a kinologist site, and I want to describe a doc. So which element I should use? So the guy needed elements for the doc. Because you cannot have element for everything, or you, are, you have an e-shop and you are selling a books. So you need to describe a book, this is a book, this is the name of the book, this is the cover of the book, this is ISBN of the book, this is the price of the book, this is the rating of the book, and so on. So it's not possible to do everything just using the elements. So we have a microdata. The microdata allows you to describe almost everything, every content on the page, so the content will be, autom will be automatically readable by some, by some computers or some special software, for example, search engines. So the system is, first, you need some dictionary describing your item. So you need dictionary, for example, describing a doc, you need dictionary describing a book. Uh, there is a one website, schema.org, and this website is uh, most commonly used place to find, uh, to find dictionaries. So it's used by Bing search engine, by Google search engine, by Yahoo search engine. It's probably used by your, some local search engine, for example, in Czech Republic. We doesn't use Google, we doesn't use Bing, we doesn't use Yahoo, we use sesnam.cz. It's most used search engine. And those search engines supported the dictionaries from schema.org. So we have the dictionary describing something. Now we need some attributes which connect my content with the dictionary. So those attributes is this item scope, item type, item prop, item ref, and item ID. So using those five elements you can di and dictionary, you can describe the content of your page. So first look at some dictionaries. Is the schema org? Those schemas, and let's open a book schema. You can see the I have book, book of creative work, and the book is a thing. And here you can see that the some 
you know, most common thing has some description, some image, some name, some URL. Then creative work has, for example, author. And here on the bottom, I can th find things specific for a book. The book edition, book format, illustrator, ISBN, number of pages, for example. And if you want to use it on your page, the usage is this. Okay. Item scope means that everything what is inside element with this attribute belongs together. Item types tell me, okay, everything inside this element is a ta of type now event. And here I have item property. So item property start date is a property of the thing event. And I have the item property location here. But location is of new type, is in, of type place. And again, everything what is inside the element, diff, this one, belongs together and is, a, is of type place. And so on and so on and so on. So with this combination, you can describe almost everything. Uh, what to do if you are missing some dictionary? So for example, if you want to describe a doc, and there is no dictionary for doc on the schema.org. OK, you can create your own one. And maybe in the future, this your dictionary becomes a de facto standard to describing, let's say, doc. So all pages writing about docs will use your schema, or your, sorry, your dictionary. But you know, it's not, uh, it's not enough. Because sometimes you need to add some kind of in this information like this to your application. So your application can need some information like this. Or you need to put inside the web page some information, for example, for your internal search engine. Not for the public one, but for the internal one. Or you are a developer, you are a developer and you need to add some information to some elements for your JavaScript application. For this reason, we have here custom data attributes. Custom data attributes allows you to create your own attributes, which are totally independent on the specification. The only rule here is you start with data dash, data minus, and then you can put your own name and of course your own value. This data, custom data attributes are most used just for the JavaScript application. So you can decorate with this attribute some elements for your application for the JavaScript one or for some the internal search engine or something like this. I think the typical example of the usage is uh, jQuery mobile. jQuery mobile is uh, this is the framework for uh, to, uh, this is the framework for creating uh, mobile websites, and so you don't need to take care if you are running the website on uh, Windows Phone or iPhone or Android or Badu, Migo, BlackBerry, Symbian, and so on. This is the typical usage of the custom data attributes. Forms. I hope you remember that this new independent group, this web hypertext application technology working group, the first job or first work they, they did was the new specification of web forms. If you are if you are collecting some data, some input from the from the client, you must do data validation. I expect that every one of you is doing validation on the server because it must be on the server. If not, you will probably have some problems in the future with some attackers. But it's of course very good idea to do same validation as I'm doing on the server, to do same validation on the client. Why? Because I want to save some uh, round trip from the client to my server and I want to save the server computing time and so on. 
So if I am doing, this is like the first barrier before the server on the client. So I can do the client validation. I, I can do validation on the client without contacting the server. And I need a JavaScript for that. And it's very common that I need uh, some JavaScript to test the user input on the client and I'm the Java developer and so on. So the new idea of the new forms is that there will be new types of the form and depending on the type of the form, there will be automatic validation. For example, if I use input type equals email, it means I want the email validation on this input box. And it's done by design, it's done by specification, so you can see that you can that uh, one of the ideas of the HTML5 is move job from JavaScript to the specification of the markup or CSS. So now I don't need so much JavaScript because the validation is on is by design is in specification. I just specify okay this input type is type of email, phone number, URL, etc. So on. So on. We have some kinds of attributes, so for example, if you want the value is required, you have attribute required on the input field. You need to validate some another pattern. You can use regular expression, this combination with pattern attribute. For example, if you want to validate zip code, I don't know the system of the zip code here in Serbia, but the check zip code is three, three numbers, space, two numbers. So I can validate it very easily using some regular expression. For forms, you have new pseudo classes for CSS. I will speak about pseudo classes in more details in my next session. So it means you can set, you can create the rule for some input depending if it is valid or invalid, if it is required or not required. Again, you don't need JavaScript, for example, to change the style of input box, you can use the CSS rules. And of course, for JavaScript, we have some events, we have some properties. So let's have a small look on demo. So here I have, uh, this is the input, and the type of the input is email. It's not valid, and again, this one is done by attribute. The red color around the CSS rule for invalid input. And if I change it here, and again, press button, now it's everything okay, because this is valid email address. Of course, it, just, it uh, checks just the structure of the address. It doesn't check if the address really exists using some MX record somewhere. Okay. Multimedia. Is the beginning of uh, those super smart smartphones like iPhone and tablets like iPad, uh, we had a big problem to play multimedia on those devices because there is no flash and typical flash is used. The same is with the Silverlight or another plugin. So you cannot find in any device like a smartphone or, iPad or tablet, uh, the, those uh, browsers are, let's say, plugin free. So we need a way to play some multimedia content on those devices. So we have two new elements. The one is audio, and the second one is video. The audio plays audio content, video plays the video content. Video element and audio element are standard box elements, so you can style it using CSS. So if, for example, you can turn the video 180 degrees, it's no problem. You will see it later. 
But what, is, what problem is that the W3C doesn't tell which video or audio format must web, vendor, uh, web browser vendor support. So they just tell, okay, the video should play video. And that's all, and nothing about the format. And it uh, becomes a huge issue now. Uh, the video is, uh, the audio is not so important, so I will speak just about the video. At the beginning, there were, you know, two groups. The one group, Microsoft and Google, we supported H264 because H264 is industry standard. You have it in your mobile phone, you have it in your camera, you have it in your video camera, you have it in your Blu-ray. It's almost everywhere. So it's industry standard. But uh, there are some patents, there are some owners of this format, and every producer of the content using this format must pay some fee to the owner of H264. For us, as uh, consumers, it's for free, or we pay this with the value of, for example, operating system. On another side, another group, there were Opera and uh, Firefox. They told no, everything on the internet must be for free. We want to use the OK. Okay, it's totally for free, it's open source, but the quality compared to H264 is very, very bad. But uh, things change. Google is owner of uh, codec VP8 and the format WebM. So Google stopped supporting H264. So now we have the three formats of the video supported around the browsers. And what to do? First, I have no idea who will be the winner. Maybe Google because it's strong. Maybe H264 because I have enough money to sue Google. Maybe OK, because the guy in W3C stopped this and tell, okay, we must use the OK because it's for free. Really, no one knows. So what format use? Probably both of three. All three formats probably will use. Or you must know your client, your customers. Because if your site is mainly used by the customers using mobile devices, H264 is your choice because it works on every device. If your customers are more using Opera, I have no idea about the Opera market share in Serbia in Czech Republic is very, very small. You must use the OK. It really depends on your customers. And the situation is quite funny now because the Microsoft is producing plugin for the Chrome to play H264 and Google is producing plugin to Internet Explorer 9 to run that app. The situation is really funny now. But as you see on the bottom, you can specify more than one source for video and the browser choose the best one or the first one, uh, which is uh, understable for the web browser. And what is interesting now, I know about this feature less than V, so I'm, I doesn't have it inside my presentation. Uh, there will be standard. There will be standard for subtitles, so you will you will be able to specify the source of subtitles, and this video element will use the subtitles as you are using it, for example, in TV and so on. It's very important for again for the people which are deaf. So let's look demo. So first. Here's the web page where you can check what is supported by your browser. So I have 264, it's a, there is a native support inside the Internet Explorer. I have plugin for WebM here. Another 264, another kind, uh, another uh, profile. And the last one is the Flash Player. So you can try it here. If you need to run WebM, there is a plugin for Internet Explorer 9. So here you can download the plugin and play WebM inside the Internet Explorer 9. 
and let's look to some source code. The first audio, I have element audio, source, autoplay, it means it start playing after it's after the page is ready and controls it shows you the controls to control the audio Bazinga. one more Bazinga. I love this TV series uh, with the video it's quite similar where's my video where's my video I didn't open it it's here my window. Again, source controls autoplay. And uh, what can be interesting for you, the source for the video or audio must not be from the same domain as your application. It can be from the different domain. I can I can show you it uh, in a few, min a few moments. So let's play it. This is standard video. If I come back on it, you can see the control panel here. It's quite noisy plane. Here you can see the buffering. Uh, be aware, uh, video element doesn't support streaming. It just can play video. It doesn't support streaming or any enhanced a type of streaming like smooth streaming it really doesn't support for this you need different technologies like silverlight flash or quick time and as i told you it's a just you know box element i'm using def 11 first time so sometimes i lost something here and it's a new functionality in def 11 in visual studio 2011 it's automatic comments inside the CSS, I like it. Five. Refresh. As I told you, it's just the box element. I think that if I have TV, if I'm being producer, I like this style of videos. So you can apply almost anything any rules for box element you can apply on the video element. And as I told you, you can use uh, the source code, the source video can be from different domain. So this video is running from different domains than uh, my web page. So it's allowed, it's okay. There is only one exception. And this exception is uh, when you are using this video, for example, for some manipulation inside the canvas, it cannot be from the different domain than the, your web application. You will see it in my last session uh, tomorrow. It's like a mini site. Resources. So it's end of my it's end of my first session. The resources. I recommend you to buy or read some book about HTML5. And the reason is that the specification is really huge. The specification is really big, and you need to know where to use which semantic element. Especially this book, this is introducing HTML5, is quite old, but there is a very nice description which element, which, semant which semantic elements is good for, when to use it, when not to use it, and so on. W3C. W3C specification, as I told you, it's not finished. It can change a lot. So it's, uh, you must be very careful what are you using. And 
you must know your customers if you can use something or not. For example, you must know your customers around the video element and so on. HTML5 tests to it. Then you can test the functionality of your web browser against the HTML5 specification. Almost every vendor browser has some system where you can send your problems with the rendering of something inside some browser and where you can send your problems with the browser. And of course, the official uh, validator. Some demos uh, you have seen were from the IE test drive website. I will recommend you to read the engineering blog website because there you can find very interesting information about IE because this is written by the guys from Internet Explorer team. And if you want to test something which is not really finished, which is really, you know, new and can be dangerous on the production side, so if you go to HTML5 Labs, there you can download some plugins with some experimental functionality, like IndexDB. IndexDB is a database inside the web browser, for example. It's an object database, it's, an error. it's not a relationship database, but it's a, some really experimental thing. Or Media Capture API. So Media Capture API is JavaScript API, which allows you to access, for example, microphone from, from, your, from the client computer. Okay, openness and interoperability. Probably you have seen this uh, slide. Almost everything I was speaking about was about the standards, about the independent standards, and those standards are totally independent from Microsoft. So we are just implementing them, and it works. And the last thing, please fill uh, the inform Phil, how do you like uh, my session? Maybe you can win HTC Mozart. It's a white good phone. I, I use it a couple of weeks for testing of HL of the Mango version of Windows Phone. Okay. And now we have uh, some time for your questions. So any questions? Typically in Serbia, it's no one asking. It's my first session in Serbia in the last three years. No one asking. Nothing changed for the last three years. The question is, uh, if you can find this presentation online, I hope yes, because some nice lady asked me to upload the presentation to flash disk. And the lady was from the crew, so I hope it will be somewhere. Okay, the question is, I spoke about microdata, but there are more ways how to add this functionality to the web page. It's uh, RDFA, it's correct, and the second one is microformats. First, microformats, you can use, you can still use microformats. It's no problem, I show you. The microformats are using the system The microformats use the system of the classes. So, for example, if you want to describe some address, you use the special names for the classes. You can see it here. Of course, you can use it. It's no problem. But let's say it's obsolete in Windows 5 or in XML Windows 5. Definitely, that is not obsolete. In HTML 5, but you can use it. RDF A is a totally different story because uh, inside HTML 5, I'm speaking about HTML 5, you cannot use different namespaces. There are only two 
allowed namespaces is SVG and MassML. You cannot use any new namespaces inside HTML5. If you need to use this FDFA, you can use XHTML5, and it's correct because it is XML, and inside XML you can use namespaces. Okay? No question? The question if, is if you can play a video in the full screen. As I know, it depends on implementation by the browser vendor and it's not part of specification. And uh, you can play video on the full screen or the video is automatically played on the full screen on the mobile devices. So if you, if you have some video on mobile device, you want to play it, it goes to full screen. Uh, as I know, it's not possible on now and the reason is or this full screen mode the reason is that this, it's a let's say security reason because you can simulate some different web page if it will be for on full screen you can for example simulate some bank web page to collect uh, user data this is the reason okay so last question question is if you can customize these controls on video or audio element. Answer is no. It's done by design. But what you can do, you can switch it off and you can write your own one because there is a big API for the video element and audio element. And I will speak about it tomorrow in my last session about the JavaScript APIs. The question is if they are different for browsers, yes. Let's say the, the only one which is the same as the operating system is the Safari on the Mac OS. This controls looks really like they have the Mac OS style. The rest is, you know, a little different than the style of the operating system. The question is when I am rotating the video if can if I don't rotate if I can don't rotate the controls no because it's a one box element again if you need it you must write your own controls okay so thank you for question I I will be here so if you have, if someone of more have questions I will be here you can ask me because I need to empty the place for the next uh, speaker thank you bye